Welcome back and well done for surviving exam prep lesson one, part one. Now we get on to part two, personal licensing. Now, firstly, the first video was way too long. An hour would have killed any normal censured human being. The fact that you're still here means that you're not. But still, I'm going to break this down into smaller component chunks um, because it was painful for me, which means it was intolerable for you. So let's get on. We are going to look at what you need to know uh, and be able to state in the requirements for holding a pilot's license under CAR 61 and the requirements for the pilot license and ratings. So, pilot license, New Zealand aircraft operating in New Zealand, except as provided in paragraphs M and N, a pilot of New Zealand registered aircraft operating in NZ must hold an appropriate current pilot license. One, issued in accordance with this part. Two, issued by a foreign pilot license authority and validation permit issued in accordance with 61.9. Or three, issued by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority of Australia if the Trans Tasman Mutual Recognition Act applies to that license. And what that means is to fly a New Zealand registered aircraft, anything that begins with Zulu Kilo, whatever, you must hold a current license issued under Part 61. Foreign pilots need a validation permit and holders of an Australian license can convert to a New Zealand license under that Trans Tasman Mutual Recognition Act. Continuing the requirements for pilot license and ratings. D. Aircraft type rating. Except as provided in paragraphs M to Q and Rule 61.57, a pilot of New Zealand registered aircraft or a foreign aircraft operating in New Zealand must hold a current type rating for that aircraft. You cannot just, as a, an Aussie citizen, jump into pretty much anything and try and take it off the ground and fall out the sky like a brick. Makes sense. So, one, issued in accordance with this part, this part being CAR 61, attached to a foreign pilot license and specified in validation permit issued in accordance with 61.9, or attached to a foreign pilot license issued or validated by the pilot licensing authority of the country of the aircraft registry, or attached to a foreign pilot license issued or valid validated by the Pilot Licensing Authority of the country in which the New Zealand aircraft is operated. 5. Attached to a pilot license issued by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority of Australia under that Trans-Tasman Mutual Recognition Act of 1997. And that needs to apply to the license. So, a student pilot who complies with subpart C is not required to hold a pilot license or rating Q, a pilot of an aircraft, when authorised by an appropriately qualified flight instructor, is not required to hold an aircraft type rating when demonstrating or gaining experience in order to obtain that aircraft type rating. Now, demystified. Firstly, you must hold a licence before you can be issued with a type rating. Note, section M. A student pilot is not required to hold a pilot's licence or type rating whilst learning to fly. So, you can bounce between um, a 172 and a, uh, a PA38, should you need to. Um, but what that means is a student pilot is not required to hold a pilot's license or type rating whilst learning to fly. While learning to fly a new type of aircraft, you must get an instructor's authorization and demonstrate and gain experience flying that new type before being issued with that type rating. Next, logbooks, general requirements. A student pilot and the holder of a pilot license issued in accordance with this part must maintain an accurate and up-to-date logbook containing the following. The pilot's name, details of an aircraft type rating and certifications, authorizations and ratings held. And a record including details specified in paragraph B4 every flight during which the pilot acted as flight crew or a member of an aircraft and every simulated flight performed 
for the purpose of crediting time or completing currency requirements for a pilot's license or rating specified in this part. And a record of each flight test, flight review, competency demonstration and flight crew competency check. And this includes the following. Purpose of the flight, date of the flight, the expiry date of the flight test, flight review, competency demonstration or check. And the name, client number and signature of the person conducting that flight test. Flight review, competency or demonstration of the check. So, pilot logbooks need to be kept up to date with the fullest amount of information. Continuing, the following flight and instrument flight details must be recorded in the logbook. Date of the flight. For a flight in an aircraft, the aircraft category, type, registration mark of the aircraft. The flight time and the simulated and or actual instrument flight time and any type of training including dual instruction and command practice as well as if appropriate the name of the flight instructor safety pilot um, now for flight in synthetic flight trainers so again a little bit ambiguous but the details of the synthetic flight trainer and the instrument ground time and any other ground time the function of the pilot as any of the following PIC, PICUS, so pilot in command under supervision, but only to meet the requirements of Rule 135505. <coughs> Co-pilot, student, etc. Right? So the following flight and instrument flight details must be recorded in the pilot's logbook. The purpose of the flight, including the place of departure, any intermediate landing, and the place of arrival. Whether the flight was conducted during the day or the night, obviously has a direct impact. Um, for a flight under IFR, the number and type of instrument approaches, uh, approach procedures flow. For a training flight, details of the training exercise, what you were trying to uh, achieve during that, that flight training operation. Uh, for a flight in a glider, the method of launch for the flight. And for a flight in a balloon, the method or type of inflation used for that flight. And we go on. The logbook required in paragraph A must 1. Be an approved bound book with details entered in indelible ink and a list of each flight record as a separate entry on a computer-generated flight record inserted permanently into the logbook, so stapled or whatever, but it needs to be permanent and three, for a series of flights on the same day as a separate entry, surmising the total flight time for the series of flights if the purpose of the flights included place of departure, any intermediate landings, and the place of arrival are the same. And number three, be certified at the bottom of each page by the pilot to, if, to the effect that every entry is correct, as well as be retained permanently by the pilot license holder unless the pilot license is revoked in accordance with the act, in which case the logbook must be retained for a period of 12 months or more from the date of revocation. Basically, your pilot's logbook is a legal document. So, D, if a computer-generated report is inserted into a logbook under paragraph C22, the pilot must make a written logbook entry surmising the total flight time of the flights listed in the report in respect of each function under paragraph B. E, and this is incredibly important, an incorrect entry in a logbook may be altered only by putting a line through the, in, through the entry in its entirety and by adding the correct information either beside the entry or on a new line. Generally, it is accepted that if you put a horizontal line right the way through, start a new line, it shows that nothing is being tampered with. F. Before a pilot submits his or her logbook to the director for any reason, the pilot must 1. On each page, total each column of entries. You'll see that at the bottom, you need to do a tally, and then you carry that over to the next page. 2. In the space provided, enter his or her total flight experience. And 3. 
below the last entry signed to certify the correctness of those entries. G. Every entry in a pilot's logbook must be made within seven days after completion of the flight. That is a legal requirement and needs to be adhered to. To be recorded except in the case of flights on an international air transport operation, the entry must be made within 14 days of the flight. Under PPL, you're not going to do international air transport stuff, so seven days is your limit. If a pilot is engaged in an operation away from base where the logbook is normally kept because we don't want to keep that logbook with us at all times, if we have to ditch or we have to bail or for whatever reason we have to depart the place where that's, you don't keep the logbook with you. All right? So, if a pilot is engaged in an operation away from base where the logbook is normally kept, the entry in the logbook must be made within 48 hours after RTB or return to base. Now, all of that stuff means, in its simplest form, a pilot's logbook is a legal document and each pilot is responsible for maintaining their own logbook. If you need to, ask your instructor to help you fill out the correct columns. Note, if you make an error, no corrective ink such as whiteout can be used. You must put a line through the incorrect entry and write your correction either beside the error or on the next line down. There is much debate regarding if you are allowed to skip a line or have to write each logbook entry one after the other. There is no ruling saying that you can or cannot skip a line. For clarity, put a line through that and start on the next line is currently acceptable and that is the cleanest way to be able to prove that nothing nefarious is going on. Logbook entries must be made within seven days after completing your flight. The only exception to this is an international ATO where pilots who must make an entry within 14 days of their flight, you are, if you're doing your PBL courses, you're not going to be doing international. Seven days is your limit. The pilots might be on a 10 day trip away from home and do not have to carry their logbook with them because of risk of losing it. Once they return from that trip, they must enter the details flight within 48 hours of return. All right, but. For you, for all intent and purpose, seven days after completing your flight, but a good rule of thumb is 48 hours after completing the flight. All right? But most importantly, legal requirement, logbook entries must be made within seven days after completing. Now, what do you remember? Under which part are pilots' licenses issued? Part 61, part 62. Part 91 or Part 119? Part 61. Requirements for a pilot's pilot, uh, pilot license and ratings. Pilot license, New Zealand aircraft operated in NZ, except as provided in paragraphs M and N, which doesn't include you. A pilot of New Zealand registered aircraft operating in New Zealand must hold an appropriate current pilot license issued in accordance with this part or issued by a foreign pilot license authority and validated under a uh, validation permit issued in accordance with 61.9 or issued by the Civil Aviation Safety Authority of Australia if in trends has been mutual recognition. Most importantly, part 61.9. You have a type rating and you are current on a Cessna 172 and your friend asks if you can fly his 182 to New Plymouth to pick him up and bring him home. Are you allowed to fly this aircraft? Similar questions, very, very similar questions have been asked in the exam. So, A. No, you must hold a Cessna 182 type rating and be current on a Cessna 182. B, yes, the, seven, uh, the Cessna 172 and the Cessna 182 are sufficiently similar that a type rating is not required and being current on a 172 is enough. C, yes, if you carry out three takeoff and landings, you may fly with passengers. D, you can fly a 182 if your friend is current 
is a current instructor and will be instructing you on the way home. No, you must hold a Cessna 182 type rating and be current on a 182. Firstly, you must hold a license before you can be issued with this type rating. Note section M, a student pilot is not required to hold a pilot's license or type rating whilst learning to fly. But while learning to fly a New Zealand type aircraft, you must get an instructor's authorization and demonstrate and gain experience flying the new type before being issued that type rating. How long after a flight must you enter the flight details into your pilot's logbook? A. As soon as possible. B. Within 24 hours. C. Within 48 hours. Or D. Within 7 days. Bearing in mind this is the legal requirement. The answer is D. Within 7 days. Every entry in a pilot's logbook must be made within 7 days after completion of that flight to be recorded except in the case where international air transport operation exists. The entry must be made within 14 days of that flight. If a pilot is engaged in an operation away from the base where the logbook is normally kept, the entry in that logbook must be made within 48 hours of return. But the most important thing is, must be made within 7 days after completing the flight, if nothing else uh, fits. Well done, a lot simpler, a lot smaller, and I think we'll keep with this format because it's nice, easy, and it's quick. Um, we can do the knowledge base and we can do the Q&As, and you can keep reviewing these. Bearing in mind, you've got to be able to get all of these questions right in order to feel confident about uh, setting the exam. So, don't forget to like, subscribe, you've, you've always appreciate it if if you if you like the item I know this is a boring component but Jesus Christ we've got to get it done take care guys all the best